2021 is over, but it's not too late to look back at the season's most standout matches. Hopping right into this countdown, my 10th match of the year is Lila Fernandez's upset victory over Naomi Osaka at the US Open third round. Fernandez had been touted as a player to watch for a minute prior to this match. Aside from claiming her maiden tour title at Monterey, the unseated 18-year-old hadn't done much in 2021 prior to New York. Meanwhile, Naomi started strong winning the first slam in Melbourne, but diffed off a bit due to both on and off court struggles. Regardless, Naomi was the big favorite and many people questioned why this was the headlining Ash Women's match instead of Sabalenka Collins. Layla showed early on that she belonged on this big stage, holding her own against a powerful Japanese woman. Naomi's experience appeared to be her saving grace though, getting crucial breaks in the 11th game of both sets. However, she played a sloppy game when trying to serve out the match and things began unraveling for the third seed soon after. After claiming the second set, Layla immediately broke broke Osaka in the first game of the decider and it looked like Naomi would just gift her the win. However, being the champion she is, Osaka continued to battle and was solid on serve, but Fernandez was just too strong at the end and got the job done. I think this match is really overlooked in terms of quality, probably because of the way Naomi imploded in that second set tiebreaker, but aside from that, it was a pretty high quality battle. Osaka played decent in this match, and while she wasn't at her absolute best, Fernandez deserves her credit for elevating her game in the crucial moment and holding her nerve until the end. This match also really delivered in the drama department and turned out to be the crucial catalyst for an incredible run by Layla here in New York. At number 9 is the Wimbledon semifinal between Karolina Pliskova and Arna Sabalenka. Going into this one, we pretty much all anticipated a three-setter as the previous two encounters between these two women went all the way to the distance. Pliskova had the slight edge, not dropping a set all tournament up until this point, while Arna had the tougher opposition, playing two-seeded opponents to Pliskova zero. The serve in return would be the two most important shots in this battle between the ball strikers. Both served well as expected, but Pushkova returned particularly well, earning herself 8 break points in the first set. However, Sabalenka upped the ante on serve when necessary, erasing all the Czech's chances. At 6-5, the Belarusian finally got her first break opportunity, and it couldn't have come at a better time. A Pushkova double fall gifted Sabalenka the opening set, despite the second seed being outplayed for most of it. Carolina maintained her high returning level though and was ultimately rewarded in the 5th game, breaking Arna at love. Up until 5-4, Pushkova was clinical on serve, only dropping 4 games in the 2nd, but when serving for the 8 seed quickly went down to left 30 deficit. She rebounded nicely though and hit 3 forehand winners to shut Sabalenka out. Carolina continued this momentum into the decider and immediately broke Arna, which was all she needed to claim victory. This match didn't have a lot of long drawn out rallies, but the ball striking was clean and crisp. Both women had far more winners than unforced errors and served incredibly well. Matter of fact, they set a woman in record for the most aces hit in a woman's singles match at 32. The difference maker I feel was second serve points won, as Sabalenka won 19. 19% fewer than her counterpart, which is also why Pushka was able to be so effective on return. Sabalenka had more firepower, personality, and game-wise, but Carolina's steadiness and experience of being at the semifinal stage previously paid off at the end. The eighth match on this list is another Pushkova one, as it features the Czech second round clash between American Amanda and Isimova. These two had played three times previously, with Pushkova taking them all in straight sets. Their most recent meeting was actually three weeks prior to New York, with Carolina claiming a funky 6-1-7-6 round of 16 match at Montreal. There were early signs of another straight sets route here, but Anisimova was able to stave off some early break points before going up a break herself. Pushkova broke back immediately though and claimed the opener 7-5, despite Amanda holding a pair of break points at 5-all. Anisimova didn't let that disappointing finish get to her though and kept swinging away to hold her own in the second. Pushkova's serve was on that night, so it was hard for the American to break through and get the upper hand. Her persistence ultimately paid off though, as while up 6-5 in the second set tiebreaker, Pushkova double faulted, heading Amanda her first ever set over the check. In the decider, Pliskova continued to rely on her serve, hitting a record 24 aces throughout the night. Meanwhile, Amanda's groundies were firing on all cylinders, especially her backhand. At 5-all, Anna Samova faced 4 break points, 
but with some clutch play and some help from the late night Ash crowd, she held and we were ultimately sent to a tiebreaker. Amanda's commitment to her backhand aided in her going up 5-2 in the deciding breaker. However, Pliskova took advantage of a lapse in the 20 year old's form, winning 4 consecutive points to go up match point. The American showed her incredible poise, saving the match point before holding one of her own at 7-6, but just couldn't stand the barrage from Pliskova. Carolina raised her level when she needed to and ultimately closed it out after another Anisimova backhand found the net. Now even though this match was on center stage, it's still pretty overlooked and perhaps that's because of its later start, but still the ball striking and shot making from these two was amazing. I was truly on the edge of my seat and was shouting pretty much the entire third set because Amanda deserves a big win, especially after all that she's been through. The crowd was electric as well, but ultimately Pliskova was just too good at the end, prevailing for another incredible win. Taking the seventh spot is Leila Fernandez's quarterfinal clash with Alina Svitolina. Both women came into this match with solid wins over champion counterpunchers, Layla beating Kerber and Elena Simona Halep. Despite playing her first major quarterfinal, the Canadian team had a much stronger start, taking control of the points and not being afraid to charge the net. Meanwhile, Svitolina wasn't that active in the first set, playing too passive, just hitting 4 winners to 11 unforced. When Elena did step up and try to do something, Fernandez was there to find an answer, flying all around the court. However, Svitolina was able to keep the Canadian at bay in the second set, flying out to a 5-1 lead. Layla didn't go without a fight though, breaking back before holding numerous break points at 5-3 for a chance to putting the set back on serve. Elena wasn't letting up this time though, storming back to send us into a decider. Fernandez though kept her form from her late second surge and broke first to go up 3-1. Svitolina once again struck back with a brick of her own before Layla upped the ante even more to reclaim her advantage and go up 5-2. Svitolina was 2 points from defeat on 4 separate occasions, but the Tokyo bronze medalist played gutsy tennis when her back was against the wall, pushing proceedings into a tiebreaker. This breaker eerily mirrored the third set as Fernandez raced out to a 4-1 lead before Svinalina clawed her way back to level things at 5 apiece. Ultimately though, the team phenom won the final 2 points to reach the final 4. I have to admit, I slept on this match when it was going on live, literally, but going back and rewatching it, I was amazed at how many incredible rallies there were. It wasn't even Fernandez bullying Svitolina all around the court most of the time, but both women stepped up and produced the most awe-inspiring points, which got off Arthur Ashe on their feet. I have to credit Alina for how well she played, but full praise of course belongs to Layla for rising to the huge occasion and bringing out her best tennis when needed. At number 6 is yet another Layla the match and this one is from the round prior versus Angelique Kerber. Coming off a resurgent summer swing and a solid third round victory over Sloane Stephens, the 2016 US Open champ was many people's favorites to hold the winner's trophy, especially with the wide open draw. However, Leila Fernandez was determined to prove that her win over Naomi Osaka wasn't a fluke. The Canadian was the first to break and consolidate, taking advantage of any short replies from Kerber. However, the German was able to take advantage of Fernandez's weaker serves and got a greater feel for the team's patterns. Angie anticipated nearly each of Leila's shots, which contributed to a 6-4 first set comeback for the 16th seed. Kerber's excellent return and gave to her an early break in the second, which she consolidated with peak service placement and ball redirection. Despite being down a break for a good portion of the second, Layla continued to rack up convincing holes and waited for her opportunity to pounce, breaking Kerber at love to level this encounter. These two lefties gave us rallies filled with unreal angles, exceptional defense, and the most bizarre net exchanges. You honestly just didn't know what to expect, as one minute you can see them scrambling for minutes at a time, then the next they're cracking forehand down the line return winners. Fernandez was just a little better at these things and took the second set in a hotly contested tiebreaker. Despite dropping the second, Angie was still people's pick to get the W as she won her last 8 3 set matches. There were early signs of there being a ninth consecutive deciding set victory as she had great chance in the 4th game. Kerber was unable to cash in on her opportunity which proved to be the major turning point of the match. Fernandez pulled off a boomerang break and then sort of ran away with the match at the end, winning the last 5 games to overcome a fading Kerber. 
This match was just brimming with high quality tennis, especially the first two sets and a half. Layla could have easily laid down on the second after going down that deficit, especially with how well Angelique was playing. However, she problem solved and truly took control of this entire match. Angie and Layla have very similar game styles as both love to take the ball early and are excellent defenders. Youth prevailed here though, as by the end, Layla clearly had more energy than the German, mostly due to the amped Armstrong audience. Starting out the top 5 is Maria Sakri and Bianca Andreescu's Midnight Marathon at the US Open. These two Miami Open semifinal was another battle that could have made this countdown, but I feel like the level here was a bit higher overall. Sakri was coming into this one as the slight favorite, having an overall better season than Andreescu. Plus, she was coming off a solid win over Kvitova the previous round. Meanwhile, the Canadian appeared to be rounding herself into form in New York, still holding a 10-0 win streak at the year's final major. Andrescu had a dream start, going up 3-love and having a break point for 5-1. However, Sakri kept chipping away and up the aggression to level things at 4 apiece. Towards the latter end of the first set, both women were in full flight, absolutely crushed with the ball. Anything short was basically a done deal. At the end though, Andrescu aided by Kraft and a bit of luck, closed out the 63 minute opening set. The level only continued to rise afterward, with Maria and Bianca engaging in numerous baseline battles and attempts to win the battle of court positioning. After four consecutive breaks midway in the set, Andrescu's superior returning and net skills gave her multiple opportunities to break Sakri and serve for the match. Giving credit to Sakri though, she really went for it when her back was against the wall, brushing aside all those break points. Maria used this to her advantage, taking a 6-3 lead in the second set tiebreaker. BB saved all three set points, but wasn't able to withstand a fourth, pushing this match into a third. The levels still remain sky high between these two, and after a long opening two games, Bianca got first blood, breaking for a two-love lead. However, the physical wear and tear appeared to take its toll on the 21-year-old, who soon after required treatment for a left thigh issue. Despite her best efforts, Bianca couldn't fend off both the injury and a surgery Sakri, who sealed victory on her fourth and final match point opportunity. This match would have huge implications for both players. For Sakri, it provided her the opportunity to go deep at a slam once more, which she did, but underperformed in the semis. Then, if Andrescu won, it could have been that one match that turned her season and really entire career around. I think it hurt BB deeply that she couldn't cross the finish line because her slam winning level finally returned, but she wasn't able to reap any notable rewards. Still, both should be incredibly proud of that performance, as is heralded by many as the match of the tournament. The fourth match on this list is Angelique Kerber and Sarah Cerebus Tormo's three hour Telso at the woman in second round. Both of these women are notorious grinders, so it should have been no surprise that we got a match of this caliber. Still, Kerber had the advantage of being a far more experienced and accomplished grass court player. Plus, the 25th seed was brimming with confidence after taking a towel at Bach Hamburg the week prior. All seemed to go as planned at the beginning, when Angie got first blood to go up 5-3. However, Cerebus Tormo stormed back and made Kerber work for it before the German closed out the opener 7-5. After recovering from an early break deficit, Kerber had her eyes on a straight sets win going up 4-2 in the second. However, Tormo once again battled strong, winning the last 5 or 6 games of the set, while saving 2 match points might have add to send this epic into a decider. Both women dropped serve twice to open the third set, but the quality was still sky high, as we were treated to numerous long breathtaking rallies. Kerber then took control and went up 5-2, but the Spanish woman continued to display her incredible defense while mixing against some slices and sneaky put away volleys. Finally, after 3 hours and 18 minutes, Angie hit one last penetrating backhand down the line, this one out of Tomo's reach, to seal her spot on the third round. This is definitely one of the most overlooked matches of 2021, but those who did watch were really in for a treat. Each woman gave their absolute all with very little dips in level or lows. The court two crowd showed their appreciation too, giving both players a well-deserved standing ovation. Kerber used this match to propel her to the Wimbledon semifinals, falling to eventual champ Ash Barty. 
Tormo maintained this form and actually beat Barty in the opening round of the Olympics. If Slash when Angie and Sarah play again, the tournament directors need to make sure it's a center stadium court match. The third match here is Naomi Osaka and Garbina Muguruza's Melbourne matchup from earlier in the year. As day 7 approached, all eyes were peeled on this matchup, as both women were two of the most informed players on tour at the time. Both Naomi and Garbina crushed their opening three opponents at the Aussie Open, and you got the vibe that whoever won this clash would ultimately claim the title. This was also the first meeting between the two, and there did appear to be a few nerves as both women exchanged early breaks. Things did settle down soon after as Osaka and Mukuruta started to get into their grooves. Naomi though lost focus a bit in the ninth game, making 4 consecutive unforced errors to hand the spirit an opportunity to serve for the opener, which she ultimately did with ease. Corbinia just seemed comfortable and in control of every exchange, breaking the third seed immediately to open the second set. At this point, Osaka was still spraying more airs than necessary, so she made a conscious effort to just hang in the point longer to give Muguruza an opportunity to make a mistake herself. This worked to a T as Naomi quickly got back on serve. Muguruza served strongly hereafter, as did Osaka, so there weren't many other looks for either to break again. However, in the 10th game of the second, the reigning US Open champ took advantage of some second serve looks and broke the spinger to push it to 3. It looked like Naomi would run away with it in the decider after going up break point at 2-1. Here, Muguruza increased her aggression and retained control, breaking the three-time major champ the following game. Gurbinia managed to weather the Osaka storm, outlasting the Japanese woman in those longer baseline exchanges to come within a game of victory. The 14th seed appeared to have the W sealed, going up double match point at 5-3. However, these were on Osaka's serve, as she erased the first match point with an ace, then got rid of the second after coasting a forced error from the Spaniard. Naomi then closed the game out with a screaming forehand down the line winner and an ace on the tee to make Muguruza serve it out herself. The 2019 champ continued to apply the pressure, and on her third break point opportunity, finished another grueling exchange with a forehand winner to level it at 5 all. Muguruza didn't go away by any means, but Naomi was just a bit better at the end and wore her down to come out on top. This was by far the best women's match of the 2021 Australian Open, and perhaps most important. Osaka went on to win the Australian Open, which was her sole saving grace of 2021. Meanwhile, Muguruza could have easily lifted the Daphne Akers trophy, further propelling her career and solidifying her Hall of Fame status. The main takeaway I feel is the only outstanding mental fortitude, this being her first slam one after saving a match point. Now, Osaka wasn't the only woman to win a major title after being match point down last year, as Babor Krejcikova did this at Roland Garros during her semi-final contest with Maria Sakri. This match was a roller coaster ride from beginning to end, as both players battled through nerves and surges of high level of play from each. The higher ranked Sakri got the first break and had an opportunity to go up 4-1 in the opener before Krejcikova settled down a bit and rode off 4 consecutive games for a 5-3 advantage. Sakri, as she often does when facing deficit, struck her forehand with even more conviction, winning 8 straight points to level the set at 5 all. Barbour managed to halt Maria's momentum by throwing in some off-pace high balls to extract more airs from the Greek woman. Her sneaky strategy proved to be effective as Krejcikova swiped the 56 minute opener to come within one set of her maiden slam final. Sakri didn't waver though, storming out to a 4 love lead in the second set. Once again, Krejcikova incorporated those higher moonball S shots which helped her win 3 games on the trot. The 17th seed wasn't letting her lead slip this time though, finally leveling the semifinal on her third set point opportunity. Despite a somewhat lengthy bathroom break by Krejcikova, Maria maintained control of the decider early on, breaking to go up 3-1. Sakri kept this lead and ultimately went at match point on Krejcikova's serve at 5-3. Barbour didn't blink at all though, playing an aggressive point topped off by a gutsy backhand swing volley winner. This match was now in Sakri's hands and despite being 2 points away from the win here on 2 separate occasions, Krejcikova's moon volley came to the rescue, breaking the Greek woman to put us back on serve. The drama only heightened as the set progressed and in the 14th game of the set, Krejcikova had match points of her own. This time, Sakri stepped up to the plate, saving all three match points faced in the game with some bold, fearless tennis. After failing to close out that game, 
Krichikova would have a 4th match point chance at 8-7. Here Sakri seemingly sailed a forehand long, leading Krichikova to believe that she finally clinched the match. However, despite the line judge and Hawkeye's out calls, the chair on power overruled and made the pair replay the point, which Sakri claimed with the backhand winner. Despite the frustrating exchange, Krichikova kept her cool, and on her 5th match point ended an 18 shot rally with another backhand down the line winner to officially book her spot in the finals. I remember people giving this match a lot of flat because of the moonballing and dramatic momentum shifts, but I still think this level was incredibly high from both throughout. Obviously there are going to be nerves as it was both women's main and stem semi-final, and I think all things considered, they handled them extremely well and played well throughout too. This match was really Sakri's for the taking, as the first set was on her racket, then of course she had match point and the third. The difference was Krichikova's greater maturity and composure, as she knew how to play those big points. Sakri, in my opinion, was far too passive when things were tight, which ultimately led to her demise. This still stands as the biggest match of both these women's careers, as I feel that Maria would have taken the title had she beaten Barbour. She'd already knocked out the defending champion Svantec the previous round and was playing like a major champion champion herself. However, Barbour's major champion mentality brought her over the finish line versus Coco as it did with Maria and that's why she's a Grand Slam singles champion. Finally, taking the number one spot on our countdown is none other than Paula Badosa and Victoria Azarenka's Indian Wells Championship Classic. This was a rather unexpected but understandable final meeting as Badosa had been knocking on the door for a big result all year. Meanwhile, people were long looking for Azarenka to recreate her late 2020 form that saw her nearly lift the US Open trophy. Vika held the advantage in the experience department, being a true time champion in the desert. Meanwhile, Badosa had a bundle of confidence, claiming straight set victories over Goff, Krichikova, Kerber, and Jabir. This first set was just full of mess, as both players had missed breakpoint opportunities early on, before trading a bunch of breaks after short momentum stints. Paula and Victoria were both two points away from claiming the opener, but faltered ultimately, sending things into a tiebreaker. The breaker was an adventure in its own right, as Paula quickly went up 4 love before Azarenka came back to level it at 5 all. Badosa won the next two points to finally seal the 80 minute opener. Things couldn't be any closer as both won 55 points apiece in the first set. In the second set, Azarenka began to widen that margin, looking the far more energetic player. She cruised to a 6-2 second set win and looked to be charging towards a record-setting third BNP pair by open title. Badosa, however, seemed to be strategically reserving herself to go all out in the decider, breaking Vika off the bat to go up to love. Azarenka fought back to regain her imposing court positioning, breaking to put us back on serve. Both women held the next few games, but those holes didn't come easy, as these players regularly capped off lung-busting rallies with scorching down-the-line winners. This was primarily a battle of the baseline exchanges, with Azarenka notoriously excels at. Her expertise appeared to pay off as Vika broke a distressed Bedosa to serve for the match. At 5-4-30 love, I thought for sure Azarenka had it in the bag, but something came over her as she subsequently made full unforced errors to let the Spaniard right back in. This was practically curtains because even though Azarenka helped to push this match into a tiebreaker, Badosa ran away with it 7-2 to clinch the biggest title of her career. This match practically had everything, both highs and lows, but when both women played their best at the same time, you just couldn't help but be glued to your screen. You didn't know what to expect the entire time because the level was so equally high from both. Azarenka was arguably the better player here, having a superior winner to unforced error ratio and winning 9 more points than Badosa overall. However, Paula held her nerve and took full advantage of Vika's choking. This championship obviously carried a lot of weight as Andrew Wells is deemed the biggest title outside the majors and the UN championships. Speaking of the WTA finals, Badosa was able to qualify for Guadalajara thanks to her title run in the desert further boosting her ranking and experience at the highest level. The sportsmanship between these two champs was equally pleasing to see, and it appears as Ranka manifested a rematch as these two are set to play in the opening round of Adelaide in a few days. Perhaps that one would be the match of the year in 2022. Anyways, that's all for this video, and let me know your thoughts on the countdown in the comments below. Do you agree or disagree with my picks? Also, what are some matches that you feel should have made the cut? Make sure you all subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post new content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time here on Grand Slam Tennis News Today.